This summer, Tate Modern is dedicating an entire wing to two of the most important artists working today. One is a visionary who invented a new language of modern art. The other is one of Europe's most radical voices. Until now, Tate, Britain's largest arts institution, has never given a show of this scale to an artist from Africa. This is an incredibly exciting moment. After decades of neglect, the voices of artists like Ibrahim El Salahi and Meshat Gaba are finally making themselves heard. And what they're saying is this. For a hundred years, the West has been missing a crucial part of the story of modern art, Africa. Over five decades, these artists have faced neglect. We are kept in the dark. We are kept outside in the cold. They fought against ignorance. I come from a city. I come from a place where we go for a job by car or by motocross. We don't take the horse. They've searched for their own identity. There is no such thing as Africa. We, we are just in the world. Should we be calling anyone an African artist at all? They are simply artists, and they have the right to claim the world. Yeah. Since 1998, England has been home to a godfather of African modernism. In his 82 years, Ibrahim El Salahi has lived through revolution, imprisonment and rejection. Now he lives quietly in Oxford. Strange enough, I, I, I never wanted to go to art school. I, I meant to go to study medicine. Why didn't you want to go to art school? <laughs> no, not that I didn't want to, really. But I, I felt I wanted to, to, to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. As a promising young artist, El Salahi trained in Khartoum in Sudan. At 24, he won a scholarship to one of the world's foremost art schools, the Slade in London. Oh, this is... This must be really early. That's uh, quite early. Yeah. This is uh, what the slate. So this is um, around about the uh, mid-50s. Mm. At the slate, El Salahi embraced modernist art. In 1957, he returned to Sudan with a crate full of paintings and organised a show of his work. You must have been so excited on the, the opening evening of the exhibition yeah. and you felt, must have felt so confident that all these new things oh, yes, that you'd yes, learned yes. were going to come across, people would be coming up to you. I, I felt great because here it is, I brought the work, all these kind of wonderful achievements in Europe and so on. To start with, they came and they enjoyed the soft drinks they had <laughs> on the first day of the opening. And then they left and they came, never came again. And this made me question what I brought in from the slate if it's not acceptable to people mm. and they're not, not responding to it in any way. For two years I was really stuck and I didn't know what, what to do. At the start of the 60s, Ibrahim travelled Sudan, searching for a way to connect. The answer lay deep in his heritage. This is something very valuable. It's a prayer book from the Mahdi sect. Wow. A Sufi. You can see the lines together. They make a picture. Here. This is the, the, the word of Muhammad. Here is the design itself of, um, think of the M, the Ha, the M, mm. and the D in a circle. It feels like an example of them taking letters and then abstracting them in some yes, way. Yes. The more you play, play around with it, the more you discover the potential in terms of design and pattern in it. The abstract forms of ancient Sudanese culture captured his imagination. Through it, Ibrahim El Salahi discovered his voice. Ibrahim's vast body of work is partly in storage. Some of these paintings have never been seen by the public. They show the powerful way his ideas developed. Let's show you this one. 
I think we'll have it here where you can see it better. When was this made? Very, very early 60s. Ibrahim used African motifs as well as Arabic script to draw people in. This is Allah ah. never dies. This is the messages which I used to write, people understood. For them, it's far more readable and closer to them than any painting or anything else at all. The writing, the word, which means a lot to them. My message was to the people. Ibrahim became an important figure in the Khartoum School, a group of artists who found exciting new ways to fuse modern art with calligraphy. I think through time, it melted into the picture. You can find in the shape, and that's a kind of an A, but it has a flourish on top, which is there. So the thing that springs to mind when I look at this immediately is texture. I mix oil colours with um, enamel paint. So by the time the surface of the enamel paint is dry, I start tickling it. So it wrinkles itself. I wanted to get the smell of the earth itself. Because as children, when we were taken to a new home, they make me smell the ground. They put their hand on the, on the ground and they make the, make the child smell to create the link with Mother Earth. It really seems like you're imparting a sense of Africa. Absolutely. And Absolutely. was that what you were striving to do? Yes, yes. this is to do with the identity. Ibrahim's paintings captured the mood of a nation finding its voice. As independence spread further, he became an important figure throughout Africa. It was a very, very lively movement in Nigeria at that time. Mm. And uh, not only in Nigeria, but uh, throughout um, West Africa. And people became aware of their nationality mm. and uh, uh, identity as Africans. And that is a world of heritage behind their back to lean on if they want to take it. Yet Sudan's hopes for independence had gone awry. By 1969, it had become a military dictatorship led by General Numieri. Three years later, Ibrahim was asked to become the director general in the new Ministry for Culture. I felt that there is a need for things to be done and they approached me to come to help in doing it. And I thought that in, in one's own country, if you don't do it, who will do it for you? In 1975, mm. you were working in the Ministry of Culture, yes. and then one day, out of the blue, two people arrive, take you away, mm -hmm. and suddenly you're put in prison. I was accused of uh, helping my cousin, a cousin of mine who happened to uh, be an army chap, and he staged a coup, a military coup. I had no idea whatsoever what was happening, except that people came and beat the hell out of me. <laughs> Until now, I'm suffering from it, though it's many, many years ago. The place I was in was in Cooper Jail, which is the toughest jail in the country. Quite a number of people were um, executed there. What were the conditions like? Um, while you were there, what, what was daily life like? Honestly, each day, for lack of food, or proper food that can be edible, uh, lack of medicine, bad treatment, each day looks like a, a year. And this went on for six months and eight days until we were let out. Ibrahim was released on March the 16th, 1976. His arrest was part of a wider government crackdown on artists and intellectuals. When a friend offered him a job in Qatar, he made preparations to leave Sudan. Someone came behind me calling my name. He said, we heard that you are leaving the country, don't leave. I said, why? He said, because uh, the president wants to make you a minister. I said, thank you very much indeed. Please thank, thank, thank them all. And I'm just going out for a short while. I'll be back soon. 
<laughs> Ibrahim wasn't to see his homeland again for many years. He took a day job in Qatar. His exhibitions ceased. But Ibrahim had helped pave the way for other artists from Africa. He'd given the next generation a dream. They too could travel the world and invent their own new languages of modern art. The problem was, the rest of the world wasn't listening. In the Western art establishment, there's a strict hierarchy. At the top is Europe and America. Art from Africa is pretty near the bottom. Over the past 20 years, a handful of young African artists have been forcing change, and Meshach Gabra is someone who's really shook things up. Meshach Gabba's Museum of Contemporary African Art is a huge project. It involves a laborious two-week setup. This installation has 12 different sections. Here you are in the salon, look living room. You see cushion, you see place to sit, you see you have a piano. Oh, wow. Wait, can we have a go? Yeah, you can play where you want it. Yeah, look at public, you can play. I only know one song. I need to, I'm just learning this song at the moment. Most museums don't let you learn the piano, but this isn't a real museum. This is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, what are you going, what yeah. do you do next now? It's the same oh. way the public <laughs> enjoy this salon. Meshach's Museum of Contemporary African Art is an artwork where everyday life is part of the show. It's a labour of love that took five years to complete, between 1997 and 2002. There's a games room full of puzzles. An architecture room where you become the architect. And even a marriage room that documents a performance piece. Meshach's actual wedding 13 years ago in a museum in Amsterdam. It's a vision of Africa you might find surprising. I remember every moment I started making this kind of work, many people were shocked. People think, yeah, you don't like show your roots. I, I don't know how many times I hear this thing. But uh, I think uh, my root is what you see there. I don't come from a forest, I come from a city. Meshak's story starts 3,000 miles away in West Africa, in Cotonou, Benin's largest city and the place of his birth. Wow! That's amazing, that is amazing. Look, the yellow cap Whoa. is the taxi in Cotonou. The people in yellow yeah, uh, yes, it's the taxi. The taxi. Yes. That's a lot of taxis. Yeah. And this, this kind of landscape of uh, modernity, really, there's just so many people. Yes. It's incredible. Don't you see the real life for Cotonou here? Meshak's taking me to Dan Topka Market, one of the key inspirations for his work. How long do you think it would take to walk around the whole market? No, I think you need one day. A whole day? Yeah, I think. It's so big market. Ah, uh, no, monsieur. Uh, no, monsieur. No, monsieur. I'm broke. <laughs> it feels like you could buy anything here. Yeah. Moi, je pense que je vis dans un monde moderne et c'est ce monde que je veux montrer. Maintenant, si quelqu'un a la mentalité romantisme sur l'Afrique ou a déjà dessiné l'Afrique dans sa tête, il est bienvenu, mais pas dans mon Afrique à moi. For Meshak, art can be found in the joy and rituals of everyday life. Everything is insulation. Look, this is nice insulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. It's, it's so beautiful. Yeah, it's and is this, uh, is this it's, it's for it's cooking. Objects, yeah. It's for cooking. It's a separate object. It's an object you buy one by one. Mm. It looks like a minimalist yes, sculpture. Yes, <laughs> I don't go for art book for learn installation. I go for this kind of market for learn installation. When Meshak started his career in the 1980s, economic crisis loomed over Benin. Somehow, Meshak managed to turn the situation to his advantage. You like here? I do like here. Yeah, we live here, we work here. It's uh, also at the residency. In the 90s...